Oh, fantastic. Right. Well, I'll just give it a couple of minutes just to make sure. In theory, it should go live on the um, Facebook page as well. Let's check that works. And then we shall get started. I think. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we're live. That works. All right. That's a... Okay. Excellent. Cool. Uh, we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Got a few people joining. Um, so, as always, thank you everyone for popping along. Um, we are recording this, so it will be available for everybody to watch at a later date so they can see Tim and my good self in glorious Technicolor. Hello. Um, so, yeah, today we are joined by um, Tim Berry, um, a I hate to use the word veteran because it sounds a little bit old, but uh, uh, an experienced individual in uh, in creature shops, animatronics, works on various horror films, Doctor Who, and more importantly, probably the last three or four, five, possibly Star Wars films in the uh, in the trilogy. So, first of all, Tim, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time to come across and um, have a chat with everybody. Um, as always, if anybody's got any questions just throw the questions up and uh, we'll do our best to uh, to pick up on them as they as they come through um i can see can you see this question feed tim uh on my right hand side i can see people writing stuff oh ah, uh, cool it doesn't say who they are though it just says facebook user facebook user yeah yeah we're, right. we're trying some new software so it does it does do that so um uh, it, all the questions are anonymous, which is protects the, Maybe the innocent, I guess. <laughs> cool. Play, yeah. So, um, yes, it is. let's start at the very beginning, I guess. So, Tim, I mean, background. You you obviously worked in the industry for quite a while, but how did it all start? Where where did it start, really, and how did you get into it? Um, well, first off, I just want to say thanks for inviting me along to this. Um, I kind of feel like I'm following in the footsteps of some. Um, Pretty incredible guests you had, so I do appreciate you having me on here to talk shit for an hour. So um, <laughs> hopefully, it entertains some people. Um, I um, I started when I was when I was quite young. Um, I had an interest in film since an early age. I used to watch a lot of films, um, mm. you know, even going back into uh, before I was ten. You know, I was really interested in the Star Wars films and all that kind of stuff, and. Um, I never really pursued anything. I just had an interest in films, like most people are interested in something, until I got into my uh, late teens when I was about 16. I um, was doing retaking my O levels at the time, and I found a book in the library that had um, how to do special effects in on the TV. It was a very basic book, but really interesting. That kind of made me realise that I could do this for a job. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't until I was about 24 when I was out in the world working that um, I thought I need to do something. I need to change my life. My life was going nowhere. I need to do something. So I decided to uh, follow this stream again. Um, and I did a short course that was two or three days long that was uh, makeup and kind of special effects. Um, after doing that course, I then started to look for a full time course. And I managed to find a course in Redford, um, which is uh, north of England. Um, it was a two year diploma course. And I went on and did that. Um, sadly, the course wasn't amazing. They had a very strict um, kind of thing that they had to do. Um, but during that time, I just decided to really get as much out of it as I could. So I would be doing more than the curriculum asked me to do. And I just really 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 got into it and I met a load of really cool people there um, after doing that course I decided to move to Sheffield and I set up a, like a little creature effects studio in Sheffield uh, mm -hmm. with some of the guys uh, with some of the people that I've known from college and one of my old tutors from college as well and we just worked on a lot of low budget type uh, films um, TV stuff um, yeah, and it was during that time I met another guy who who was on the same course as me, uh, same course as that I did, but a few years behind me. And we eventually went into partnership. 
and we ended up moving down south because there was a project out here and it was a film called evil aliens which is like a it was a low budget sci-fi film by a guy called mm. jake west um had a lot of special effects in it um and both me and this guy called tristan my old business partner uh we got a few people in and we spent a lot of time uh, making all these kind of gory effects uh for this for this film um following that it it didn't really seem like there was a future in our partnership uh so we went our separate ways and we ended up freelancing uh, i started in fact no sorry both of us started at a company called millennium effects which is the guy mm. who all the doctor who stuff um and i was there pretty much at the beginning when they first got Doctor Who. Um, and I've been off and on at that company for several years now, leading up to the point when I first started in Star Wars. Cool, so um, I mean, if, Tim's given us a few pictures to kind of share, I guess, and these are pretty much from the um, from the, the Doctor Who days. Um, I think we, you, you did mention though, you, you, you needed this, you built this little piece here, which um, was, used for what this got you all your jobs did it apparently. yeah so this um this um when i was uh, living up north um i uh, got in touch with a few companies down here looking for work this was before we we really got into a partnership um and one of the companies i went to saw was a, a company called animated extras and one of the guys there looking through my portfolio at the time and he was like he's like you know um to get a job in this industry, you've, you've got to make something that's kind of shiny and something that kind of stands out. People really want to see something that's 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 um, that's interesting. So I took his advice and I came back and I thought about it. And then I decided to to make this, which was um, an animatronic hand. I mean, I'd, I'd always been obsessed with Stan Winston um, at the time. Mm. So for me, Terminator was one of my favorite films uh, as, you know, kind of growing up. So I wanted to make something like that, a Terminator hand. Um, and I had a lathe at the time and a mill. So I thought, well, oh, okay, it's my first time ever doing this kind of stuff. I thought I'd have a go, see how I got on. So I ended up making this just as a showpiece, um, trying to get work. And basically this this piece has got me pretty much all the work that, you know, that I needed to use a portfolio for. Uh, it got me in at Millennium Effects. Um, it got me to uh, other companies. Um, I mean, since since then, I don't really use a portfolio anymore, but um, it was a piece that it was recommended to me to make, and I made it, mm. and then basically it's just got me work. It's kind of what started me in the industry. Um, but at that time, I was so naive, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it took me a few times to understand how a lathe works, or how, how, how to mill. Um, I didn't know what taps, taps and dies were, um, so I'd be using screws uh, to literally make the tap. Um, to make the, the threads in things. Um, so that was a lot of back and forth, you know, busting threads and all that kind of stuff. But eventually <laughs> I got it to that point where I made this and yeah, I was I was super chuffed with it. And it and it, and it does work, you know, it does yeah. it was a, a I put my hand in front of here, but it was an animatronic hand, it could, you know, do all this. Uh, it could do this as well. The thumb it probably needs a bit of work, but it could do that, do this as well, and all that mm. kind of stuff. And it also managed to do this as well, which I quite liked. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, it's, cool. it's something that's going in my in my bedroom. I just keep it as a display piece. And I guess at, at Millennial Lemma, you you went and started off as, and that that was, I guess was your stomping ground, was it, or were your early days of working out and understanding how to do things, and a whole learning curve of, and Doctor Who, I guess, is a pretty pretty cool thing to um, to kind of work on, is it? Yeah, Doctor Who was was really cool. I mean, I, I worked on the first two episodes, which was the Autumn one uh, and the Slovene episode. Um, hmm. like to make uh, like three pairs of hands for the Slovenes. Um, but during that, I mean, I, I was never on Doctor Who full time, but uh, they were the first two episodes I worked on. The picture you're showing there was uh, an episode that I went on set with. I didn't actually build this character. Um, I was asked to go on set um, with it, which was fun because I got to wear a, uh, a pterodactyl costume and chase after one of the main actors. Um, yep. And basically, I think I was told just to go at, at him with this thing. So I was just <laughs> on set with my hand up, up, up its backside and basically chasing after one of the main actors with a, with a dinosaur. 
uh, which was cool. Um, yeah, um, and but for me, I think the, the funniest thing was um, I got to make a character called Handles, which I think you showed a picture of uh, a minute ago. Of um, is that the Cyberman? It's the Cyberhead. Yeah, it was. Um, it was for an episode where the Doctor Who's uh, stuck somewhere out of time or something, and he he finds an old Cyberman head, and he basically makes it his companion. It was a, a character called Handles. Um, hmm. So I delved more into the model making side of this. And I ended up making pretty much that character, um, which was really cool. It was um, a character now which has been known as um, his longest serving um, um, companion because of yeah. you know the time, how, how long he had the character and stuff like that. And that was great, taking that on set. And um, yeah, just being part of a kind of a, a notable character that's kind of got a bit of lore to it now, which is quite fun. And was it was it quite um, a sort of a fast moving, high pressured environment on Doctor Who? Because I mean, I guess you've got episodes and television work. As well. how, how does it differ TV from film? Um, is just trying to think. I just it's it's the same kind of thing. Um, Film TV has kind of a, a different atmosphere in where it's kind of new to the people that are in the industry. So there's different, not necessarily conflicts of interest, but there's um, there's a lot of people that are trying to find their feet. They don't, they're not as comfortable as they are. Um, mm. where in Star Wars, everyone's kind of act is kind of top of their game. So they've they've got nothing to prove. So there's mm. a different there's a different vibe. Um, Star Wars is very much more relaxed and very much more friendly, where Doctor Who can sometimes be, uh, I'm hesitant to use the word conflicting, but um, it's just different mentalities, what would I say? It's just a different environment. Um, Production-wise, it's the same thing. You, you never have enough time to build stuff. So Doctor mm -hmm. Who, there was never enough time uh, to do as much as you'd like to. Um, and that was that's pretty much the same with Star Wars as well. But um, um yeah there's always a difference crew wise it feels a bit different um, and also we we have a bit of a thing where because special effects are never involved uh, completely all the time uh, on set you know we only come on to do the stuff that we do so for doctor who they create a family because everyone's part of that production team but you only mm. come on for the odd days so it's not like you're an outsider but you do you do notice that there's a very there's a click um, yeah. where you're slightly you're slightly out of that click because you're not a part of it. But over time, you start to make friends and you start to, you know you start to get a little bit more um, involved in that kind of area. Um, this um, this thing you're showing here is um, um, the original uh, suit that there was made for a TV show called um, uh, Earth 2020 or something like that. It was filmed okay. in. It was like a children versus uh, robots type TV show. Uh, and then the, um, Millennium ended up buying them back from the production and we ended up putting them in Doctor Who in the same episode, I think, that the dinosaurs are in. Um, right. And I got to make the gun part that sits on the top of, of it. And I got to be on set with it as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, a pretty heavy costume, but um, the guys inside, uh, the Super Bombers, were, were awesome. Uh, so it was, good. it was good fun being on set for that one. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, I guess, uh, was millennial. Uh, so how long were you at millennial? Were you there for a good few years? Yeah, I'd say um, I, I don't really know. I've, I've kind of lost the track of time, but um, <laughs> off and on, yeah, I must have been there for a good, um, I'd say seven, maybe seven years, maybe. Um, Gosh. Yeah, I mean, I scouted. You know, I went up to different companies here and there. I worked for a company called Image Effects at one point as well. Um, which is an older company run by a guy called Bob Keane, um, who um, used to be a part of the original Star Wars crew. He worked under um, Stuart Freeball originally, right. uh, and we worked mm -hmm. for him for a bit on a couple of projects. And he was great. He was fantastic. I always had some great stories to tell. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Millennium has always been my stable go-to until until you know I got the phone call about Star Wars, and then it all changed from there. <laughs> As they say. So uh, go on, t talk us through that then. So we move from we move from millennial and and you get is it what? Did you literally just got a phone call or? So um, 
No, it was um, it was uh, uh, Gustav Hogan who runs the mech department. Um, I met him and I've worked with him before um, at Millennium and uh, you know various other places, and he was my go-to. And uh, during when they were crewing up for seven, or they were sorry, they were in the mid-production of seven, I got in touch with him and he was like, "I'm sorry, but we we're fully crewed up. You know, we can't get anything." So I kept hassling him um, <laughs> when it was leading up to Rogue One. And I was actually at Millennium uh, with a friend of mine, a, a guy called Pete Hawkins, who's another another mech designer. Um, and he'd he'd worked on Seven, and he was due to go on to Rogue One. And I remember getting a phone call from Gustav to say, you know, "We'd love you to come and join us. Um, you know, come and do a, a couple of weeks trial uh, with us, and we we'll see where it goes from there." And I, and because he, he's always like, you know, don't obviously don't tell anyone; it's top secret. Um, so I was like, okay. Um, and I knew Pete was starting on it, so I was, um, uh, Pete, I've got some interesting news like this, and it was almost like we'd, we'd go into corners and whisper about it. Like, right. oh, <laughs> like um, so that's kind of what got me started, and I went in, I did a couple of weeks, a uh, couple of weeks, um, kind of uh, had to build something in a couple of weeks, basically, as I guess a bit of a trial period. And then after that, we had a bit of a break, and then I ended up actually in physically starting on day one on Rogue One. Um, yeah, and that was just a whole different world. Um, I originally started in the model department, and um, so my job was kind of a, an intermediate between the animatronic department and the model department. So I was involved with um, anything that was in the model department that had some kind of an animatronic edge to it, um, which was cool. Um, the, the picture you've put up actually is um, is uh, one of the first days I was on set um, for Rogue One. I was there with Lee, uh, Josh as well, who's you know the, the designer of uh, BB-8. Mm. Um, and um, this picture was was quite funny because the the mouse droid there is me operating that mouse droid, and the blue circle on the right is is where I'm hiding, literally behind right. that um, that kind of pillar there. And that was. Um, that was the greatest, greatest day on set. It was a night shoot, but um, I loved every minute of it. You know, I was I was walking around. I was uh, driving a uh, mouse droid in front of stormtroopers. I had stormtroopers <laughs> running up and down and stuff. I was on the radio and I'd go, I'm working on Star Wars. I'm working on Star Wars. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that a tube was, station? Uh, sorry? Is that a tube station? Yeah, it's um, Canary Wharf, I think. Um, Canary Wharf, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's uh, the... One that we kind of moved in on overnight. It was all it was all planned. It was all planned well in the head, and we did it over a night shoot. So by the time they closed down the um, um, the uh, the um, the tube station, we literally moved in. Uh, production moved in there, set up all their um, their um, art decoration stuff, and then um, then we shot, and then we we were out by the time. Um, everyone started getting back in in the morning. Yeah, it was, uh, mm. it was a fun shoot. I mean, where can you be when you're surrounded by stormtroopers? It's, it's <laughs> incredible. Uh, I know we're talking to, well, I guess Lee, Matt, everybody really did so far, and it's all been um, most of the guys that work on the film, on the sets are absolute avid fans as well. You know, it's yeah, really, really exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it, no, I, I, I hasten to say it's, Nothing will ever be better than this, but for me, I don't see anything else being as, as good as the stuff we did for Star Wars. Um, and do, do you do everything? I mean, do you do, do you do kind of painting? Do you do makeup? Do you do animatronics? I mean, how does it? How does it? Do you, is it all hands on deck on certain creatures? No, no, we have departments. So we have um, we have different departments. We have a model department, and we have an animatronics department. We have a paint department. We have a mold shop. Uh, we have a foam department that does all the kind of foam skins uh, we have a seaming department we have a hair department we also have the office and we also have fabrication as well um, I'm sure I've missed out um, someone in that but we have loads of different departments I think at maximum we have maybe about 100 plus people in our department um, but yeah it's a it's a it's a full-on thing um, and like I was saying earlier on for Rogue One I was I was mainly part of um, the uh, um, uh, model department, which as later films became the droid department. Um, mm. That's where I got to meet Lee. Uh, I had a desk next to Lee. 
which is great. I mean, me and Lee get on really well, and we had a good laugh. Um, we used to have what we called the Wookie Tube upstairs because we had where we were in our in our model department, we have an, an upstairs and downstairs like a mezzanine. Um, so we used to have what's called the Wookie Tube. So every so often we'd have a big, big tube that we'd put Wookie sounds into because, <laughs> because you know, <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, yeah, and it was great. And it was actually one of the first things I was a part of, which was uh, the track droids. Um, I worked with Lee on those. Um, originally, it was going to be done by Matt and Josh, um, but um, it kind of fell on my lap. Um, and it was quite an interesting thing because Lee pretty much handled all the fabrication side of the skins and the actual overall shape of it. Uh, I was just tasked with making the track system for it. Um, and Neil, our boss, had um, a few ideas in mind, uh, and I spent a few days going away researching different things. Um, and eventually, we we found you know we found a way of of it of it working within within the um, you know within design, which was great. Um, hmm. um, yeah, and it, that was good fun. You know, we we'd take it outside and we would test it, and um, we'd vomit around outside, which was great. Um, you know, without the thing on top. Um, uh, shingles was the only thing we found was an issue with it. For some reason, it didn't right. like shingles. Uh, once it goes through shingles, it um, it didn't like it. But out on the sand was great. You know, it was just it's like like the industry we do. We we just make toys for a living, and that was kind of <laughs> a real highlight because it was just a, a giant toy, um, mm. and it was nice for me and Lee to be a part of that. So, um, so that yeah, that was, that was good fun. A little bit top heavy, I believe. Yes. Yeah, surprisingly top heavy. Um, yeah, I'm sure if, if Sam Prentice is um, listening to this, he'll, he'll understand <laughs> that, 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 um, that thing yeah. about being a top heavy. Um, you did find out, I think, to yes, our yes, horror from yeah. what I remember. I've heard the stories. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we're all, um, we're all we're all you know um, guilty of toppling that 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 thing over. Um, but yeah, that was that was good fun. Um, and then on Rogue One, that was still Rogue One, was it the um, the track droids? Yeah, this we we originally built these ones for Rogue One. Um, you don't really see them in it. Uh, there is one shot where you briefly see it, but it's just static. It doesn't move around. It didn't mm. really get any real love until Solo, which again you don't really see much of it. It's there, but it's not really doing a lot. It's very yeah. hit and miss. Um, although you can see more of it. Um, but it's just it was a character that I, that I really really liked and and Lee bless him for uh, I wasn't involved with Solo because I was in the animatronics department but Lee put my name forward for one of the droids to be named after me um, and it got accepted and it's now in you know in the Vision Dictionary so there's there's a droid out there called T1M8 uh, which okay. is the green green track droid that was in Solo um, and yeah that was just such a sweet thing of him to do so. Um, I kind of feel privileged now. I'm part of Star Wars canon, you know, when it comes to a name. <laughs> which, is quite cool. which is so cool. Yeah. yeah. But um, Rogue, One, Rogue One for me was um, I had a, a chance to be a part of a character which I loved a bit, uh, which is Two Tubes. Um, and I was asked to be a part of making the, the headpiece. Uh, for me, my, my job on this was. Um, kind of uh, detailing and uh, doing a bit of cleanup. Um, Luke Fisher, the guy who designed um, the character, actually ended up sculpting the headpiece and the mask piece. Um, and I was given the mask piece, which I had to basically clean up and make it look, um, you know, sharp edges. And I then had to also make the tubes and also all the ear pieces and also all the eye pieces. So any detailing bits on there was was kind of was down to me. Um, and that was to me was a fun thing. I ended up making one. Um, they loved it so much that we ended up making two in the mm. end. Um, but it's a character that I, I I just fell in love with, and I also got to work uh, with two of the greatest people. You know, we had Aidan Cook and um, Paul Casey performing the characters, um, and they're they're you know, they're great people. Um, and it was just a fun thing. I, I love it, character bits, and it's it, it's getting its its little bit of love as time goes on. Um, and it ended up being solo as well, which is which was great. And it's been in various comics and stuff like that. But um, it's nice to see something you've worked on get a little bit of love. 
I think it's it's visually it's a it's a beautiful character. I mean, I know it's not a it's kind of it's in the background in a lot of cases, but it's it, it does it's it's quite iconic really from from my perspective anyway. Um, I think I share the love really. Yeah, I think I think they did I think they did it really good justice. I think when they introduced the character in in um, in Rogue One, it really um, I don't know it really felt very Star Warsy. Um, it had that kind of vibe to yeah. it. Um, yeah, and it's it's nice, you know. I mean, it's, it's never going to be as, as big as Boba Fett, you know, in that kind of way because it's you know Boba Fett's so iconic. But I think over time he's they're definitely getting a bit of love, you know. They're definitely there's definitely a love for that character. A lot of people make cosplay costumes out of it, which mm. is great. Um, so yeah, it's um, yeah it was fun on part of the build. One one of your favourites. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then after uh, after Rogue One, I then moved into moved into Episode Eight, and uh, Neil Scanlon, my boss, gave me the chance to end up working in the mech department, uh, which I did, which was which is what, what I always wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. And from there, basically, um, we ended up making a hell of a lot of stuff for Episode Eight. Uh, we had one sequence, the Cantho bite sequence, which you, sadly you don't really see much of it in the film. Um, but for that, we made lots and lots of characters i don't remember the exact amount but for the total film i would say there's in excess of maybe 100 characters no it couldn't have been that much maybe there was 100 i don't know there was quite a few um we made a lot of heads all had animatronic pieces in it um now for me the, the character you've got here it was for me one of the funniest things i got to build it was the the last thing i got to build on episode eight and um it was a great little character. It was essentially a um, croupier for the Canto bite sequence, and it had to walk and act like a little little character. Um, so I managed to make a, a nice little walking rig for it uh, with an animatronic head um, that could, you know, could basically move around. And you see it a couple of times in the film, static on a table. But there's a really nice sequence where you see it um, on a table walking towards. Um, Walking towards the camera. It's very brief, but for me, it was one of the funniest things I got to build. I've never built a walking rig in my life. I went through loads of tests with it. Um, in the end, luckily, it worked out fine. Um, <laughs> it was really cool. Uh, Matt got involved. Matt ended up putting his um, his uh, control system in it, which was great. Um, I had Matt, uh, sorry, I had Dave Chapman and uh, Brian Herring puppeteer in it. Um, and it was just a, it was a cool little character. I think it's got a name, Fam, now, I think it's called. Um, but it was, I don't know, it, it was a nice, it was a nice way to end the film on such a, such a, you know, such a sweet little character. Um, just trying to think. I, um, yeah, and so essentially all it was, was um, it was uh, Brian Herring under the table controlling the forward and back motion and Dave Chapman off camera. Uh, controlling the head movement. Uh, yeah, the head radio. It was a great, a great little character. The head was radio, was it? Yes. So the head was um, the head was radio. Um, it was worked off what we, what we call a, a three rod system. So you've got like a static rod, uh, two rods on the front, and as you operate the two rods on the front, you know if you operate them, so if you push both of them up. It pulls the head back. If you uh, if you alternate it, what it does is it tilts the head uh, left and right. Um, and then the, the mouth had a had a, the lips would move. The mouth um, had a movement uh, had a, what we call a slew jaw. So you could um, not only open the mouth, but you could also move the jaw left and right. To right. Give, it could be a little bit more movement. The eyes would pop up and down, and they'd also rotate as well. Um, and the hands were. Um, uh, well, basically free movement. Uh, it was uh, the rod that was attached. The hands were attached to the rod, uh, the croupier stick, and Brian underneath would have a rod attached to that croupier stick. So, of course, as yeah. he moved the rod, um, it would look like the hands are moving the rod, which was, uh, which was good. Yeah. Yes. A little character. And that was, um, that was the... Um, completely blank now that, that was the sorry the last last thing that you made for which for, for um episode eight episode eight yes of yeah. course that was that was uh, 
Fantastic. And um, Snoke as well, you were involved in the demise, were you not? Yeah, so actually, kind of like, uh, no, Snoke was the last thing I was involved in. I think it was, yeah. we had just kind of come to an end, um, and it, um, I was asked, oh, you know, could you could you do this? Um, so Neil asked me to build a um, a structure inside Snoke. So we ended up making a full-size Snoke that was cut in half, um, and I ended up doing... Um, for the top piece, I put in an armature, which uh, you could pose, a posable armature made out of armature wire. And then we ended up making the legs um, um, that were movable, like like real legs. So they were jointed, you know, mm. the knees, the, um, the waist and the, and the feet. And we ended up using um, the feet. I think in the shot where you see the feet falling off, um, and essentially all that was was Neil off camera with a bit of fishing wire, I believe. Pulling okay. it from one side, so as it fell off, it would kind of rotate and then land on the floor. Um, and then for any other shot, when Snoke's just in the background, there would just be a static uh, Snoke as lying on the ground, like you see, like there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was quite fun. I was on set for that, so it was nice to see them setting up for the fight sequences between uh, the Red Guards and that, Kylo Ren and stuff. So that was that was pretty much practical then when he when he slid off. Uh, I I think. I think the top part, when it when the top part fell off, I think that was done in CG. Right. I don't remember us shooting that bit, um, but the feet were definitely um, practical. Well, as far as I can tell, I mean, CG is so good nowadays, it's very tricky to see, but from what I remember, that's the shot that we did where the feet fell off. You know, I mean, if you can get it done in practical, why, why would you pay you know, X amount of money to get it done in CG? But I don't know for sure. You, know, you can never know for sure nowadays what is 100% practical. You know, no, I mean, we were chatting before, but I think the, the shift, um, you know, the magic of the movies for me historically was always kind of creating rubber creatures, doing something that you're thinking, how the hell did they do that? And then CGI came along and kind of destroyed that because it, they could literally do anything. And I guess what we're seeing now is a bit more of a... Um, a bit more of a pushback to using practical, but with CGI to enhance it and to, to fix things, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's very tricky. It's a very it's a it's a neat trick now, isn't it? Um, you know, you could always um, you always quote Matt on the BB-8 thing. You know, when the first trailer came out and you saw BB-8 rolling across the ground, I mean, even I was convinced it was CG. It wasn't doing mm. what they always it was done it practically. You're like, oh my god, you know. It's, but I guess that's the trick now, isn't it? Of you know knowing what is what you know finding out what is practical and what isn't. Um, and the Star Wars films are good for that now. You know, you look at a lot of the shots and you do wonder, oh, is that done practically? Um, one of the creatures that we did for Solar, which I, I think you've got a picture of, is the little bar goblin. Um, yeah, I've got that one. And uh, we were there um, on. Sh we were there shooting it. But when you see the sequence, I, I, I would like to think that they, they used that that whole thing. But there's still part of me thinking, you know, could they have gone in there and done, done some CG? It's very, it's very tricky to know, but that, that's, I guess, the magic of film nowadays, isn't it? Um, but looking at that picture there, it looks like the one that I built that was the one that they used. Um, yeah, yeah. And I guess if the performance is there and and uh, it's it's good enough on the on the film, then there's no reason really to to replace it, is there? Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Star Star Wars has been really quite cool. I think from the very beginning, I think um, they've been um, they've been so keen on using old school kind of techniques. You know, I remember mm -hmm. when Seven first came out, and there was this big thing about oh, we're shooting everything on film, we're going back to practical effects, and yeah, God bless them. They really have. I mean, they really, they really do love creature effects. You know, um, when you hear stories of, you know, JJ saying how 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 he loves our work and um, Kathleen Kennedy being really really happy, you know, happy with all the stuff that we do, you do you do get a sense of like, oh, this is great. You know, it's practical effects and stuff like that. But um, you know, we can't. I don't think we can be arrogant enough to think that. It's just our stuff there. I'm sure if it needs to be CG, we we'll step in and go. We can just enhance that. You know, um, practical effects yeah. is, is like everything else. It's not without its flaws, uh, but we we try and make sure we do our best to 
to, you know, to make it as good as we can for the screen. I mean, as a as an effects geek and you know special effects makeup, I'm uh, fascinated with. So when the new films came out, they were always always released with a behind the scenes you know, montage or set of trailers where they were showing all of the big practical creatures, um, which brings the magic back, you know, it, yes. it shows, you know, it's, it's, it's clever, you know, and it's, um, it's, it, there's not, there's not form to it. Whereas CG, um, and if Billy Brooks is watching, CG is really good. Um, but, um, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's too easy almost sometimes, you know, and it's it's nice to it's nice to see it slide back to to practical, and it it keeps you in a job, Tim, as well. I guess. Yes, exactly. You know, I think a few of us went through that whole stage of like, oh my god, what are we going to do with our lives when CG suddenly started hitting hitting the world? You know, there's a few people that are like we're going to have to get into doing CG and the stuff like that. But no, it's it's stronger now than it has ever been. You know, when when CG first came out, everyone you had the naysayers that are like, this is it, it's the end. And people now still say that, but you know, my argument is, you know, I'm constantly in work. I have, you know, I don't seem to need to worry about work. Um, mm. So for me, that just goes to prove that it's not dying. That it's it's come back. It's going through its, you know, um, it's going through a period of of love again. And I think now CG is gone to its high. It's now settling into being a part of the, uh, the film industry's tool palette. Mm. Um, and you know it's starting to level out now, and it's allowing it's allowing practical effects to regain its ground again. Um, so it's definitely going to be around here for for a long, long time to come. I mean, it's definitely changed how things are being done. Um, you know, I think in the old days, because practical effects was the only thing that they had, they would be given a lot more luxury when it comes to time. Um, but because everything is being done, you know, within a certain amount of time, I don't think um, you know practical effects is given it you know as much time as it used to be when they know that they've always got cg as a background you know as a as a, as a backup should they need it um which is the only real shame but you know you you live you know you get to work with the environment or you're given you can only do the best that you can in the end so, yeah and when you when you're building these when you're building the creatures, do you, do you specifically build background characters that don't do a lot and then foreground characters that are, are actors or is the same level of quality pushed across all of them? Um, there are there are certain differences, yeah. Um, there are some characters that are pointed out to be uh, foreground characters, um, main characters. Um, but, um, it's, yeah, it's tricky because it depends on how they shoot it, really. I mean, Can Canto Bite is an interesting example because uh, we made loads and loads of characters. That most of our build for episode eight was Canto Bite. Um, yes. And Neil at the beginning would sit us all down and he'd be like, right, okay, you've got two weeks to do each character. And that's just the mech side of it. So we're like, okay. And he would, he would say, right, the idea is that if the camera comes past, uh, it needs to be able to capture a certain moment of that character, not static, but have some kind of movement in it. Um, so every character that was kind of encountered by it, maybe the apart from the odd one or two, everyone pretty much had animatronics. It may be in basic eye blinks, uh, a bit of mouth mm. this. but then there were some characters that had a lot of work doing to it. Like there'll be one character um, that I think Gustav did, which was like a like a monkey character, which you do see every so often. It was an all singing, all dancing. A character that would do all the stuff. I assume it's because they probably thought it was going to be a main character. But when they come around to shooting it, and there's, you know, maybe the director at the time is thinking about different things, um, that then becomes more of a background character. Um, so it's very tricky to know. I mean, there are some characters that have obviously given it a bit of love. Like in Solo, you had Six Eyes, which was obviously made specifically for that. Um, I can't really think of another character at the moment. Um, but um, but yeah, I think Neil Neil was always very keen on trying to get as much in any character as possible. So pretty much any character has got some kind of animatronics into. It. And talking of main characters, what was your involvement in the Pogs? So this was um, one of the first things when I when I first started on Eight. Um, I was involved in the first set of Pogs that ended up going to. Um, Oh God! Someone might have to remind me which one it is. Um, the um, the island, which which is the island that they shot in. Do you know, Michael? Um, oh, 
Scanigus, the one near Ireland. Ireland. Yes, thank you. Um, so it was uh, a few weeks before production was due to start and they were going to go and shoot some stuff in Skellig. Um, so I got brought in board uh, to help out doing the pool. Now this is the first time I've been working in the mech department, so I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. But luckily <laughs> there was um, a, a mech there called Chris Clark um, who designed the porks um, and he basically gave um, the designs to me and another guy called Gerard who was working there and we ended up basically assembling all the forks and making mm -hmm. it to this point. Um, uh, as you can see in that picture, that's my lovely desk in the background, um, yeah. which is quite nice. It was nice to see that on the on the kind of Caesar reel. Uh, it's not really a claim to fame to say that's my desk, but um, <laughs> it was quite nice. So um, we ended up making uh, quite a few porks that then got taken over to the Skellig and they were basically all they were was very very background characters that just sat on a on a rock in the background. And I think all they could do was their head could kind of pop up and down. They could kind of look around and then their eyes blinked and their mouth opened. Um, but that was a real introduction to the mech department uh, back then. But um, fortunately, I had I was working with with Chris, who's a, a very um, very professional uh, makeup. Uh, sorry, a, a very experienced um, animatronic designer. Um, so I was kind of following it on his. On his footsteps really with that and you, you you say you didn't work on solo even though you you had your droid named after you uh, i um, did yeah i did work on solo um oh, yes uh so solo um i um i was a part of the, that little bar goblin that you showed earlier on that's, oh, okay. uh, which was a rod puppet um and that was controlled by originally three people in the first version of solo with the two directors and then when Ron Howard got brought on board, it was um, used for um, a sequence that was on uh, Dryden's yacht. And for some reason, it went from three puppeteers to about four or five puppeteers in the end. Um, mm. So I, I was a part of that. I also um, made one of the heads for um, uh, one, of the, one of the bar rats um, that I think you might have a picture of. Um, uh, no, not that one. Um, it's the two racks on the on the next to the. Oh board. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just bear with me. There we go. Yes, yeah. So um, this was one of the first things I did in solo, and I ended up making one of the heads. And I was working alongside um, Steve Wright, who, um, as you as you probably know, passed away sadly um, mm. in this year. Um, but that was a great little project. It was just a very you know very simple animatronic head, eye blinks. Um, the mouth kind of moving up and down um yeah so they were kind of the two things that i was involved with solo i spent a lot of time on set for solo i was um i was with team moloch at the time so um i spent a lot of the time on that film on set with moloch which was which was pretty cool um and various other things um i helped out with uh, some of the uh, model guys as well were on set uh, a lot with um uh, a lot of their guys like driving uh, mouse droids around uh, uh driving the track droids around, helping Lee out and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I, I've worked on Solo, which was which was quite good. That was a, that was an interesting project. So I broke my foot on that film, had four weeks off, came back, and I came back straight. Really? <laughs> um, How did you break your foot? Is there a story um, behind it? Uh, no, it was, uh, I don't know, it was a funny day. It was, uh, we had to take one of the droids off set, and um, I uh, accidentally stepped the wrong way. And uh, my foot just gave away and ended up breaking my foot. Um, and yeah, I just had four weeks off, which was quite nice. But fortunately, because of um, you know how the film worked out, I, I could come back and I ended up redoing Moloch again as well uh, for some of the new shots that Ron Howard was doing, uh, which was quite nice. Um, yeah, it didn't feel like I did a lot in Solo, but um, Solo was was pretty fun. You know, there was a lot of on set days where we would just have a have a have a really good time um we all talk about um uh, one of the best days on set was the control room uh, on um, Hessel, where um we were on there and this it was uh, the droid guys made all these really lovely droids i came on set for a day to help drive one of the track droids and did generally help out and there was a sequence where um uh we were up against the wall and the camera was kind of looking into the room and the idea was all the main actors would come out of the room, all the droids would drive around and then follow all the actors out. Uh, so, of course, we couldn't see down the corridor because we were looking the other way. 
and we couldn't see behind all the control things. So we'd started off, they started off the shot, all the droids were bombing around. But we had no idea what was going on. There were mouse droids that would come out with, with their heads, you know, heads off because people were crashing into things. We couldn't see, you know, like, you've got to get down the corridor. When you get to the end of the corridor, you've got to try and turn left. We couldn't see down the corridor. So we didn't know what to do. We were trying our best guess. I think I ended up crashing um, uh, the track droid into Warwick Davis in his character. Um, that's when I overturned the track droid. It went up the side of the wall and was like, you know, a 45 degree angle and stuff like that. But all of us were in hysterics. It was just one of the best days. Um, yeah, it was, it was good fun that day. It does sound like a real family atmosphere, and I think you mentioned before that Star Wars is quite a unique film, not just because it's Star Wars, but also the the crew. Yeah, yeah, it's this, it's this, it's the best thing I've ever done. You know, I, you know, it's 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 stressful at times, and um, sometimes you feel like you want to, you know, um, pull your hair out. But you know, when you see the person next to you, you know, you can always get a bit of. Um, just see a smile from them and stuff like that and the people that you hang out on set with you can't you can't beat it it's just incredible the, the people all the people on set you know not only the production and all the the you know the set crew camera crew um everybody is so friendly um that you just it just feels very very good and the entire uh, creature effects crew are, you know are the, are the best I, I you know that's only arrogant are the best in the world but they're the mm. most hardest people in the world as well They've got nothing to prove to themselves or to anyone else, and I think um, it's just it's just great, you know. It's in every day on working every single day in that workshop environment was just incredible, you know. And the, the 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 pictures you haven't supplied are all the ones from episode nine. I'm not, I didn't see any. I was looking through them, but oh really? Did I not give you any of those? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, let me show you. Sadly, I can't say anything about episode nine. Sorry, so. I, I assume you did work on episode nine, though. Uh, I did, yes, yes. Uh, but that's as far as that conversation goes. <laughs> and a sad day when you were wrapping up, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very, a very, very sad day. Um, but you know, who knows? You know, with all the current news about Pine would be overtaken by Disney for the next ten years, you know, yeah. we might get another another seven years of work on it. You know, who who knows and stuff like that. But, I don't. Think, I don't think this is the end of Star Wars. Um, I think it will. Um, it will come back around again. Um, but we, you know, we just have to wait and see. So, yeah. yeah I mean, it's all stuff for episode nine. Though. You, sh you should be happy. Um, it did get well. I thought episode eight got a little bit of a bad press, but uh, and there's a, a lot riding on nine for old JJ, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think it'll be all right. I think. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Like like we were talking about earlier on, it's um, you can't please everyone, you know. No. I think with Star Wars because it's such got it's got such a lovely fan base, uh, such a um, an obsessive fan base. No matter what you make, you're never going to please everybody. Um, but you know, Episode Eight was you know like Marmite, wasn't it? You either loved or you hated it. I mean, it didn't it didn't do too bad at the box office, mm. um, you know. Solo should have done better than it did because I, I think Solo was a great film. Um, but, you know, whether it was a timing thing or, you know, whatever whatever it was. But they'll bounce back, you know. you got to understand that Lucasfilm are finding their feet, I think. You know, they're, they're finding what works and stuff like that. And I think they will, they'll bounce back. They'll, you know, you'll... I think once they move out... Personally, I, I feel once they move away from the Skywalker trilogy that everyone's so invested in, I think that's when things will will be less under scrutiny because no yeah. one would have any expectations. People will just be looking forward to seeing a Star Wars film uh, for the sake of it being there. You know? so, well, yeah. I mean, Rogue One got a fantastic reception. I think it was the, you know, they could, they could play quite firmly in the original trilogy with Rogue One. Rogue One. Um, so you weren't you weren't stretching things or trying to introduce new stories. It was all fairly safe ground and uh, they did a cracking job, really. Yeah, right. Rogue One was kind of like, you know, you had episode seven, which was trying to introduce a new audience to Star Wars. Mm. But I think Rogue One worked because it appealed to the original fan base. You know, I always think about Rogue One when, when they all turn up at the end. And all I remember is when it's in the cinema, they had Red, lead, Red Leader and Gold Leader mm. appear. And I was sitting in my chair going, oh my God, it's those guys from, you know, the original Star Wars. The original one, yeah. <laughs> the same as any original Star Wars. 
because it, it gave you that instant connection to the original films. So I think they, they really did well with that. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think Solo worked on that level as well to a point. Um, you know, there were so many little good things in Solo. Um, no, but so I guess well, the new films well, well, well. for a new audience, you know, not just us old folk that, you know, love the original films. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I was saying to you before, it was not necessarily the best judge of films is, is grumpy old 50-year-old men like us, really. It's, it's designed as action films for a new new audience as well. Um, but, yeah, we've got lots of excitement and high expectations for uh, for episode nine um, and, and beyond, because, of course, we've got the Disney Plus TV um, channel coming out now and I think confirmed, really, that we've got a six-part Kenobi. Uh, we've got some more um, series that are coming online with Mandalorian and the um, and the uh, one that's set in Rogue One, the Casper ones. So quite yeah. a bit of work there, I'm guessing. Well, I think so. I, I, I guess so. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Um, you know, I know this about as much as everybody from reading, mm. reading the internet until I get that phone call that says, "Can you start here?" You know, I never know. You know, much more more than that, really. So, um, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice. Um, it'd be nice to be a part of the maybe thing. I mean, it'd be it'd be quite interesting to see where where they take that that character. Mm. Um, but you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well. We confirmed Ewan McGregor now, haven't they, for it as well? Yes. Which yeah, they released at D23, I think. Even though everyone knew that Ewan McGregor was going to be playing it. Um, yeah. It's quite funny to see them do the whole, you know, the whole thing at D23. But um, it's a nice, nice little touch, I think. And yeah. I mean, we've touched on a few things, but it, it is that secretive there. I mean, I guess it's uh, even when you're working on, and we, let, we won't talk about episode nine, we'll talk about eight and seven, but the, um, you don't you don't get access to the whole script. You don't get access to everything except the bits that you need. Is that is that how it works, really? Um, yeah, I, obviously I can't go too much into it. Um, it's just, hmm. just, you know, need to know kind of thing, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, to be honest, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to know, you know, the stuff that happens because I, I want to go to the cinema as much as everybody else and be surprised. Um, you know, which is which is nice. You know, I mean, being in the creature acts department, like I said earlier on, we're not we're not involved all the time on sets. So we don't get to see everything. We only get a, a piece of it. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, when you go to cinema, you're you're just as much surprised as as everyone else. I mean, I, I yeah, I'm looking forward to nine because I haven't got a clue what they how they're going to go with it. Um, so it's um, exciting for you as it is for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. To be honest, I'm, um, I'm looking forward more, more forward to getting the poster because we, we when we go to the cruise show we get given a free poster, and I've got my original three posters up on my wall, um, and I've just got space for my fourth one now. So I'm just looking forward to getting that poster just so I can hang <laughs> that up. Um, but um, yeah, I I'd like to think everyone's going to be happy with it. But yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it is a safe pair of hands, JJ. So, yes. um, but to to wrap the trilogy, well, to wrap nine films up is is a bloody hard task, isn't it? I guess. So, yeah. And so, what are you doing now, then, Tim? I so at the moment, I'm just uh, put your feet up. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I ended up buying my first house at the beginning of last year, so um, I've just been um, uh, mucking around with that. I've just um, you know, I say it at the beginning of the year, but it's only taken me nine months to get to the point where I'm actually sticking things on walls, um, sorting out the garage and stuff like that. So I've had a bit of a break. Um, I've had um, some bits uh, for Millennium. I've been back at Millennium recently, uh, working on a on a feature um, for them. Um, and at the moment, I'm just taking a little a little break now, uh, just to sort some bits out around the house, and then hopefully um, near the end of the year, you know, things will start to pick up again you know the, the industry is so busy at the moment here um that i'm sure if i started ringing around tomorrow by the end of work end of the week there'll probably be something out there for me for me to do but, um, well you're yeah. banging in the middle of the big two aren't you know between netflix and, and disney with shepperton yes. and um uh yeah yeah well there's there's a there's a lot of stuff that's happening over here at the moment um you know i'm sure after dark crystal Coming out, that will that they'll probably want to do a second series of that. So there's, there's you know, there's talk about these Marvel films over here. Mm. Oh, there's there's so much work at the moment. It's um, you know, it's such a 
it's such a good time in this country. Um, sorry to our uh, US friends that might be reading this, but um, um, it's uh, it's such a great time over here for work. But you know, it'd be foolish not to use it as much as possible. You know, I, I never thought I'd be able to buy a house, um, but you know, because of um, working on stars for a few years, it's afforded me to buy that, which is an added bonus. But um, you know, I've got to keep that up. <laughs> I've got to pay for it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, apart from that, I just, um, I find myself just, um, you know, sitting at home, you know, um, playing around with CAD designs and um, just trying to learn as much as much as I can, really. I'm thinking about getting myself a, a CNC route, uh, router in the next few weeks um, yep. and just, just trying to get as much out as I can before I have to go back to work. Well, yeah. Your work is, is also very, very similar, isn't it, really? Because you're still building things, which is your passion and your hobby. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, it's cool. Right, well, I've took it took quite a bit of your time, Tim. So, But thank you so much for that. It was brilliant. Um, That's okay. Thank you for letting me. Really kind of interesting insight and um, absolutely fascinating. And so and we'll all look forward to see some of your work in episode nine and hopefully... We'll be able to talk a little bit more about what you've actually done for that one. <laughs> say no more. Okay. Say no more. We will say no more. Okay. Right. Uh, I think I don't think we've got any major questions from the floor. So uh, once again, thank you everybody for spending the time to come and join join us. As always, the um, videos will be recorded. Um, next next one we've got actually is um, a guy called Howie Weed um, from the US. Um, and how he's uh, again cr works in the creature department. Well, he was head of creatures for the um, remakes for the original trilogy. Um, he also played the Wampa, um, so he's uh, in front of the character, in front of the screen as much as he was was, was doing. Well, it's called a bloody Wampa, I think it was, because it was the one that was kind of eating the arm and throwing things around. So uh, I think that's September the 29th that that Howie will uh, will join us, and I'll pop that on the feed. But Tim, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And um, take care. And I'll see you all soon. And I'll hopefully see you very soon, Mr. Berry. Can I ask a very quick favour? Yeah, of course you can. Go ahead. To all the yeah. people that are listening, could everyone write emails to Sideshow and ask them to debug them to try and get a two tube Sideshow made, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start a website called uh, Make Two Tube Sideshow. Um, yeah. Just to see if we can get them to actually finally make one. Are we doing are we doing sideshow hot toys or are we doing both? Hot toys, whatever. I don't mind. <laughs> Whoever wants to make one, I'm, I'm down for that. <laughs> okay, let's we'll start a campaign. We'll post that up actually on the group as well. Let's see if we can get a few um, a little bit of energy towards making that toys. Um that'd be fantastic. Nice one. No Thank problem you. at all. Thank you for letting me come on. Great stuff. Cheers, guys. See you all soon, and thank you, Tim. Everyone, See you soon. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.